We're on the air. Welcome to class. Hi. Uh, being made fun of because we're blonde. Say it again. <laughs> I'm being made fun of because we're blonde. Just a minute. For all of you, you who are tuning in to this class today, <laughs> Amy's clever. We have these students at another campus, and one of them uh, brought up something we were talking about before we went on the air. And uh, this is called the Onimus. See, that sort of jumps in there. Uh, and your question was? Are we being made fun of because we're blonde? No, well, I don't know. Are they maybe being made fun of because they're blonde? No. Well, but what is somebody doing when, when, when we stereotype the dumb blonde, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> What could that be and say some guy that stereotypes a dumb blonde, dumb blonde, dumb blonde? What, what could be, be, he be projecting? Bubbly? He just can't. Uh, bubbly blonde, <laughs> which is still stereotype, still stereotype. But if, say, somebody, a culture or people, we project the dumb blonde, dumb blonde stereotype on a, a blonde woman, what, what is being projected? Remember, we have these He's ego dumb. defenses and the things that we don't accept in life consciously get dumped into our unconscious and we repress them, we suppress them, and we project them. So when someone's going through life and always sort of ragging on the dumb blonde jokes, uh, they're, they're uh, what, uh, ignorance, they're uh, a stereotype of, of, it could be a race, it could be anything. What, what are they projecting? Push the button. Push the button. Their own insecurity. Yeah, or, or their own, for lack of a better word, dumb blondness or whatever. Because remember, when we're when we treat people like stereotypes, uh, and uh, what we're doing is we're not aware of our own insecurity. Say somebody's doing that. In fact, this is so important. You really learn about your shadow through projections first. People go, how can I get to know about myself? Well, look at, the, look at the, uh, the people and things you really disparage and put down that you can't stand in other people. And remember the more affective energy you have toward that? That means like, I can't stand that, as opposed to, you know, I don't like that. See? But the more energy you have, affective energy, chances are it's your stuff. And when you adore and admire and look up to and marvel at someone or something, the more energy you have toward that, like a projection, like falling in love, as we sing in the book, we, uh, again, that the more energy toward that thing you adore and admire and turns you on, inspires you, it's probably about you. See? So that's how you learn about your shadow. That's how you become more conscious as you go, oh my gosh, you know, look at this. So, uh, uh, and in the midst of all the jokes and fun, and you know, we're just being human and stuff. And uh, but so, sometimes some pretty heavy things can be said in that, in in our humor. A lot of passive aggressive behavior. Have y'all seen that? Uh, where people are passive aggressive and they patronize you. You ever been patronized? Patra. What's patra mean? It's the father. So you patronize is sort of being demeaning and I'm the father and you're the inerrant child and I know more and you don't. Any times we do that, we are, uh, it's a form of sexism and uh, discrimination. Uh, this is good stuff. So any more comments about that, about a blondes? That I'm smarter than you. <laughs> That is good. <laughs> Are blondes smarter than men? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, there we go. Well, it can go back the other way, too, can it? And, you know, I have resisted the temptation in this class to come in here and just read a lot of stereotypical jokes that, uh, in fact, maybe I'll do some. Because w one of the reasons I, I resist doing it is because one of the things we're trying to, you know, this is higher education. We're trying to be more conscious, more mature. We're, we're actually part of coming to college is that we might understand human behavior and not just live out of our instincts and reflexive appetites and uh, you know stay in the unconscious but have awareness of what are we doing and why do we say these things and why do we f how we flippantly uh, keep people down because our weak ego can't stand on its own and how we, we our shadow just uh, runs runs everything in fact, I think I said this last week too, 
or last class, you're, you're either working on your own stuff or you're a vampire. You're either becoming aware of your own shadow. That means your wounds, the inferiorities, all the things you don't like about yourself. You're coming to terms to make friends with those things. Or you're projecting those out on other people. In other words, using them as a scapegoat, a vampire sucking off their energy, uh, either positively or negatively. Oh, and your gold, your uh, talents, your unlived life. And if you're not pursuing your own, then you're a vampire sucking off other people's, which is what the media is all about. <laughs> you don't have to live a heroic life. Just turn on and watch a hero on TV. You don't have to take a risk. Just watch a movie where somebody's taking a risk. And just live out their story vicariously and veg out on the, you know, couch potato. And uh, then, uh, is everything okay? Okay. Uh, one of the directors walks out, and I thought, oh, my gosh. Uh, so the whole idea is to begin your own sacred journey, and that's what this class is about, is about uh, understanding gender and our own gender issues in our own life so that we can become more whole persons, so that we can make a difference in society. And I'm telling you, if, you're, if you don't have something bigger than your ego to serve or to grasp or a cause or something, you're going to end up very, uh, uh, you're going to have a very narrow life. And uh, that, that's what the theme of a lot of this is. Okay. I'm just going to keep talking. I forgot your name. Dan. Dan. Dan is going to jump up on the table. And uh, everybody watch Dan fall. <laughs> Is he on the air? Are you on the air now? No, he's not up there. He's going to turn the camera on. Come on, y'all. Put this on the air. Let's see Dan. Is Dan on there now? No. Come on. Oh, we can't do it. Huang will be fired for doing it. Okay. Well, we have someone standing on my desk as we talk. Uh, just keep con continue. Uh -huh. uh, well, I wanted to read something from one of... Uh, my favorite poets and persons is Maya Angelou. Do y'all know her? Do y'all know her out there in Cinco Land? No. No. Oh, well, I can't show you on here yet. Uh, Maya Angelou is a, w one of the most beautiful women I've ever, I haven't met her personally, but I've heard her speak several times. I've read this in another class before. But uh, she seems to be a very integrated woman in the sense that she lives out of her innate femininity and yet has strongly integrated her uh, sense of her own strength of character. And uh, if you know her story at all, what's uh, the book she wrote, the first one? What is it? Yes, I know why the caged bird sings. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I've heard her share the story twice about her own life and how she was raped when she was like 11 or something. And um, they, uh, did I share this in here the other day? I don't think I did. Uh, but anyway, uh, she was raped, and they caught uh, the rapist in the uh, the project she was living in in uh, St. Louis. And they brought the man in and said, is this the one that did it? And at 11 years old, she said, I, I knew if I said yes, they were going to kill him. And she says, I couldn't cause somebody else to die. That's a pretty aware 11-year-old, isn't it? And uh, so she wouldn't sort of uh, point him out. And uh, uh, anyway, the next day, the man was found murdered. And uh, she decided not to talk. She didn't talk for many years and kept silent. And then when I think she was 16 or 18, she went to San Francisco to be with her, uh, stay with her aunt. Uh, and uh, while uh, for a summer and during that time they were having, um, it was the beginning of the um, United Nations that was starting in, uh, and uh, she went to apply for a job because by then she could speak four or five languages. Very bright young woman. And uh, she found out they wouldn't even let her in because A, she was black, <laughs> uh, and B, because she was a woman. There was an ad they put in the paper for interpreters to come. And uh, so she decided to go get the job as a summer job. And uh, they wouldn't hire her. And this, this incident created some anger within her of how unfair life is, you know. And a lot of us get transformed because we meet up with these unfairnesses in life. And then, of course, later, about th four or five years ago, I know she spoke at the General Assembly of the United Nations. 
Now there's a person who took a journey, see, to, to become a whole person and to find something bigger than her ego uh, to serve and uh, decided to go on this journey. But anyway, here's a couple of poems that, that I think are just really neat. This is called Phenomenal Woman by uh, Maya Angelou. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size, but when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's the reach of my arms, it's the span of my hips, the stride of my steps, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you can please, and to a man the fellows stand or fall upon their knees. Then they swarm around me, a hive of honeybees. I say, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, the swing of my waist, the joy of my feet. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, they can't, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them what, when I try to show them, they say they can't, uh, they still can't see. I say it's the arch of my back, the sun of my smile, the right of my breast, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud, I say. It's the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care, because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. Do you see that integration? No apologies for all of who she is. It's just beautiful. Uh, and here's another one she wrote that uh, you can hear her own story and you can see the strength of her integrated warrior. Uh, it's called Life Doesn't Frighten Me. Shadows on the wall, noises down the hall. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Bad dogs barking loud, big ghosts in a cloud. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Mean old mother goose, lions on the loose. They don't frighten me at all. Dragons breathing flame on my counterpane. That doesn't frighten me at all. I go boo, make them shoo. I make fun the way they run. I won't cry, so they fly. I just smile, they go wild. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Tough guys in a fright, all alone at night. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Panthers in the park, strangers in the dark. No, they don't frighten me at all. That new classroom where boys pull my hair, kissy little girls with their hair in curls, they don't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my scream, for I'm not afraid at all. It's only in my dreams. I've got a magic charm that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean floor and never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Not at all, not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. I mean, that just resonates something deep within. You see that sense of true self beyond the mask and the defenses and the stereotypical rows. You see this authentic person under, underneath. Uh, anyway, oh, did we get it working? Okay. <laughs> okay, isn't that interesting? They say the sign of a professional is what you do when things go wrong. So, God, I hope I'm a professional. <laughs> Did you hear what that guy said, Amy and uh, Shauna? No. Too bad. No. Well, uh, he said we don't have an overhead camera. Like we have nothing right here. Okay. 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 So let me uh, get your pen and paper out, paper out, and I'll tell you what to look up in the book for the test uh, uh, in a couple of days, a couple of classes. I put the, uh, and these are chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7. And I want to do this now because we have another class and then, and then the exam, so maybe uh, you'll have a little more time to work through this if you need it. Um, so one of them is uh, which sex increases in gender flexibility 
during adolescence? Which sex increases in gender flexibility during adolescence? These pretty much go five, six, and seven through the book. Fago, F A G O T, and Linebeck, L E I N B E C K, and O'Boyle, O B Y O B O Y L E. Could you get me some water, please? Thank you. Uh, in their study, what did they find that uh, regarding mothers uh, who did gender type play activities? What did they find regarding mothers who did gender type play activity? You know, gender type play activity is hi, son, here's a gun. <laughs> My cute little daughter. Here's a doll. See. Oh, Fago, F A G O T. Linebeck, L E I N B A C K. And O'Boyle. Another one, uh, uh, an interesting thing is uh, how do parents contribute to gender differences in children? How do parents contribute to gender differences in children? And actually, when I make up these questions and look them up, I, I'm trying to give you things that are interesting so we learn about gender differences. But how do parents contribute to gender differences in children? And uh, how is sexism apparent in the English language regarding women? How is sexism apparent in the English language regarding women? And then, uh, at what age are children apt to obey the same-sex parents? So, when do children obey the same-sex parents? Okay, according to a, uh, another thing I think is interesting to know is what, according to an American Association of University Women study, an American Association of University Women study, what was found regarding study of single sex education? Here's a little paragraph on that. According to American Association of University Women, what did they find regarding single sex education? You're a good man, thank you. We're not, we're not going to have that the whole day? Right? Okay. Have to set the water over here, because if it's over here and it hits the computer, we're in trouble. Okay, regarding uh, families, financial needs, what do contemporary adolescent women expect? Regarding, excuse me, regarding family and financial needs, those two aspects, what do contemporary women expect? really like women of old, contemporary adolescent women. Regarding family and financial needs, what do contemporary adolescent women expect? Okay. Uh, what are the favorite fairy tales from childhood of men and women? couple of the favorite fairy tales. Favorite fairy tales of in childhood of men and women. <clears throat> see, and I'm telling you, when you look at that, you begin to see the archetype. You begin to see the, why do, why do people pick one and not the other? Is it learned? Is it Nature is something deep within. Another one is, uh, how do fathers perpetuate gender roles? Perpetuate. P-E-R-P-E-T-U-A-T-E. -E -E. How do fathers perpetuate gender roles?
how do Westerners judge who's smarter? In other words, in intelligence, nurture or nature? How do Westerners judge who's smarter? Um, or who's more intelligent? Is it nurture or nature? And kind of a fun one, which kind of slams Mr. Uh, Dr. Thorndike. But what did Thorndike say about educating women? Almost a hundred years. It's working. Cool. What Thorndike? What, what did he say about educating women? Okay, and then another one, a uh, question to be good to look at is, what did researchers discover in comparing, in comparisons of men and women? This, that's a real important thing. They discovered in comparing, in doing comparisons of men and women, uh, what did they discover about that? I think there's a couple of things there. What did researchers discover in comparing men and women, in doing comparisons of men and women, like in studies, you know? For years and years we do these studies and then we often find out there are new variables that we didn't take into account. And researchers have since discovered some of the things in our comparisons that aren't really fair. Another one is, what's the largest remaining gender difference in verbal ability? Largest remaining gender difference in verbal ability. I think that I think that's still in, that's in chapter seven. All the, the last three or four are. Another one is how do teachers see boys and girls' academic success? How do teachers see boys and girls' academic success? How do teachers see boys and girls' academic success as ability or hard work? And which ones do what? So teachers think boys succeed because of ability or hard work, and girls succeed because of ability or hard work. Uh, another one is, uh, what are the major reasons for dual earners? Dual earners. Why do we have dual incomes, dual earners in the 1990s? Yeah. Okay. Y'all still with us out there? Yes. See, people are always so alert when we do the review thing. Uh, what is the ostrich effect? I think this is chapter 7. Ostrich effects. What is aversion, aversive sexism? Aversive sexism. Actually, aversive sexism is kind of very interesting. But you'll have to look it up. And then what is occupational segregation? And uh, why does Hoth's child why does Hoth's child say some workers choose to spend more time at work. Why does Hostile say that some workers want to spend more time at work? That, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I, and, and actually, in reading that study, as a practitioner, I see a lot of that in, in therapy at couples. Um, <laughs> he, he sort of you know, we do our study, we find out we already kind of have a hunch, we know. 
And then the last one, what is uh, the lack of fit model? What is the lack of fit model? I have some of the short answers. You want me to tell you those now? Please. Do you? Yes. Okay. Um, well, and again, this is just what we've talked about in class. There's no magic things here. But one of the things is, is the four psychological theories on gender role development. Remember those? The psychodynamic view, the social learning, the cognitive development. These are our four psychological theories on gender role development. It was psychodynamic theory, social learning, cognitive development, and gender schema theory. So I'd, li I'd like for you to like to list those and explain briefly what they are. And you should have that from your notes. Uh, and then, uh, you know, what is an archetype? Uh, de define it. <clears throat> and list uh, it lists uh, two feminine archetypal energies and two masculine archetypal energies that we got from the lectures. Remember, we talked about caregiver and lover, and then uh, warrior and seeker. Kind of putting that there, and then uh, and then and then and then also note the gift that each archetype provides. For our human experience, and that, that's, I don't think that's too difficult. There's a lot of this requires just memory, or, uh, but we've talked about it a lot. Um, another one is, uh, you know, from a reading on Thomas More that says gender is one of the grand metaphors uh, for uh, understanding the human conditions, and it, it'd be interesting to list, say. Uh, Five traits that we uh, that are masculine male spirit uh, we tend to see as that, but uh, and five that are uh, traits of the feminine female spirit archetype that all human beings possess. And again, you know, some of that is uh, I mean, you have gobs of stuff for that. And some of that that thing I that we went over about hierarchy, competitive, aggressive, achievement, remember, on the male, and then female was egalitarianism, egalitarian, cooperative, receptive, living in process. Remember that? Okay. And, and you know, actually, probably if you threw in stuff from that list on masculine and feminine, I'd, I'd obviously give you credit on that. So there's just a lot of stuff. I just want you to see that, see, remember, this kind of comes out of, uh, Uh, well, let me, let me just throw this out right here. See, kind of what I, kind of what I try to do, what I've tried to do in here is what we've talked about is male, female. We talked about that a lot the first test, uh, and then this period over this test, we've tried to look at masculine and feminine energies, and then ho today we're going to look at anima. And anonymous. Uh, so our first test, we tried to look at this, the biology. Now we're looking at these archetypal energies. Uh, okay. Seems to be a gender course. You got to address all of that at some level. And, uh, uh, okay. Anyway, uh, and then wh what are uh, what are stereotypes, and how are they created? And then give a couple examples of stereotypes uh, in the American culture that may be going through transition, that are going through transition. You, you may not find a lot of notes on that lecture, but there's stuff in the book about that, and that's kind of to see if you're kind of picking all this up. That's really kind of a fair question, I think. See, we tend to make, well, we tend to make archetype stereotypes. 
And then uh, another thing we talked about in class was old Mr. Hyde. Hyde study I did in class about uh, two male and female psychological differences. Remember we talked about that, uh, was it aggression and communication? I think that's right. It was. But anyway, that's a good, that's a good question. Remember, you don't have to answer all these. You don't have to answer any of them. <laughs> you don't even have to take the test. <laughs> Uh, and if you do answer all of, all nine of the short answers, I'll give you a, you'll, well, knock off the lowest one. I think a couple of people did that last time. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, oh, well, list four aspect of the pseudo warrior or the negative warrior. Remember that? The, the aspects of the negative warrior tend to stifle a, an egalitarian society. It tends to kill equality and freedom and rights of people to move up. So I think knowing, I want you to know those four aspects of the negative warrior. Partly because of knowing that uh, negative archetype out there, which is pervasive in the culture, and also know about it in here in our own psychic world uh, when it comes forth. See, because a lot of times we, we think we're encountering a person, which we always are, but we're also counting their shadow. And then you get a collective shadow when you get corporations and organizations and groups together and beliefs and, and, then, and then everybody kind of has the same shadow and then they get together and, and they uh, project that shadow on the rest of the culture. And then we're all, we're all affected by it. So I want us to be able to see that, how the negative warrior, but, but remember it always comes back to us, to me. How am I projecting my negative shadow out? Um, and, and sometimes, you know, I mean, we have to take it on out there and stop the madness, the shadow, make people aware of how their negative shadow is affecting us and keeping people from freedoms and rights and stuff. Uh, uh, recently, uh, and I know this film, uh, this tape will, go for several semesters hopefully but the whole bit of uh, President Bush with his faith-based faith programming and clashing with the Salvation Army who their uh, religious beliefs don't allow gays and lesbians acknowledge them uh, and yet you know states rights uh, have uh, laws that forbids discrimination um, and so you know, they're, so that's a big clash, you know. Of uh, suddenly we're clashing with some people's belief system, and um, and 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 then the, the general good and the general population, and and, uh, and you see that's just. I mean, there it is. There's gender issues right there. There's sexual bias, sexual discrimination, uh, as we saw last uh, test too. All in the name of God. God says the Bible says. Therefore, we believe. And then other people saying, well, you know, who speaks for God? <laughs> well, God didn't tell me that. <laughs> you know, I see it another way, or uh, I see the Bible another way. And we have these huge clashes. So tolerance and understanding is very important, and also uh, uh, owning our own shadow is very important. Okay, and another one would be the lover's shadow. We talked about that last class. Uh, the, there are four processes that help us get unstuck when we become that codependent lover. Because remember, we naturally connect. We love our caregivers. Uh, and we, when we have too much caring, too much commitment, too much investment, and we get sort of stuck in, uh, uh, as a lover that our, that our life and energy is totally dependent on another person. How do we get unstuck from that? Remember we talked about that? Do you all remember do you guys remember? Yes. yes. Okay, then there are a couple of more, um, and those I will talk about uh, next class. I have several more. 
and I'll pick pick something from We Our Book and um, from that and then uh, from the Anima Anima stuff. Okay, any questions? No, no. How come no, they don't I have to? I think I got the handout. Was it on the Invisible Partners? Yeah. Did you get it? Was it just that? Oh, oh, that, you got one handout. Did you get the one on Onimus, Onimus fight? Like this? Can y'all turn on camera three, please? Four, five, three, whatever. Did y'all get this one? No. No, we only have one. Okay, this one got sent first. Apparently didn't get there. Doesn't it take the Pony Express a long time to get out to West Houston? That was Dr. A again. Really, he strikes out. Okay. Uh, yeah, and the, I asked you, the one you got, we'll probably look at. Okay. Is, so, any questions on the kind of tests and how we're doing with that? And remember, tests are learning experiences, so have fun learning us and um, hope it makes a difference and you do well. Okay. Now, I want to talk about something else. Uh... <laughs> it's hard to draw these symbols without having sexual connotations, right? <laughs> I mean, there we go. <laughs> I can see all my friends going, hey, yeah, what do you draw in that class? Okay, and we talked about the iceberg, but I'm drawing it like this because one of the things I'm trying to acknowledge is the collective what? Unconscious. That means there's something that we all have in common, every human being. You know, and this could be, uh, remember, this could be, you know, almost like the waves of the ocean. And each wave, each crest of each wave represents another human being in, in unique manifestation of archetypal energies and unique uh, individual personality because uh, all of these energies of life, you know, are, they're everywhere. And certain people have some of them more conscious. Certain has other ones more conscious. But we have something, all, all these archetypes we have in common. And you see, it's important to know that because if, if we didn't have common uh, longings and urges and these molds that must be filled, if we didn't have these common uh, characteristics of the human experience, we couldn't even relate to one another. See, but we have all these things in common, and Jung was, he, Carl Jung talked a lot about this, and it's so important to acknowledge that everything that's in me is in everybody else, and everything that's in the whole world is, it has been in every other person is also in me. I'm kind of, uh, and then, you know, below this, we have our personal unconscious, our own issues, but beneath that, we have something far deeper, and that's a collective unconscious. So, if you will, We'll uh, put a woman here. First time I've used this symbol, hasn't it? Make this a man over here. And we talked about our ego, that thing that grounds us in reality. Uh, it takes a pretty, you have to have a pretty good grounded ego to function in life. And the things that test us and challenge us will really tell us about our ego. In fact, one of the reasons we hang on to stereotypes is our ego is not strong enough to accept differences. We're too threatened by something different because we haven't met that archetype in ourselves. That's why the more experiences you have in life, I mean, you know, healthy experiences, not anything destructive, but the more experiences you have, the more you activate those archetypes and you have more tolerance and understanding for other people. It's like having, having a friend of different sexual uh, gender or preference or uh, uh, orientation or having um, friends from uh, you know, uh, different, different races, ethnic, religious groups. I mean, the more you do that, then, then you, we move away from fear of what we don't know and we begin to know ourselves because we see these aspects in other people. Doesn't mean you have to like them or approve of them or accept them for yourself, but, but I think the conscious, maturing person. Uh, you know, must embrace more. In fact, I tell you, the, 
the, the mark of a mature person psychologically and spiritually really lies in our ability to handle anxiety, ambiguity, and ambivalence. Handling anxiety, ambiguity, and ambivalence. I'm not going to ask you on the test for this, but, I, but it, and see, we can't handle the anxiety of not knowing or being threatened by something. A mature, aware person doesn't get as anxious because a mature person has understanding and knowledge and education about something. It doesn't tend to get as anxious. The less conscious we are, the more anxious we get. The more conscious we become, the less anxious we are. All of us suffer from anxiety. Or ambiguity, you know, the, con the unknown, dealing with the unknown, uh, being confused. One of my mentors used to say, I prefer the larger confusion to the smaller certainty. Well, the larger the confusion, the more I have anxiety, the greater the ambiguity. And my ego doesn't like that. The ego's job is to get rid of anxiety, ambiguity, so I can survive. Isn't it funny? The ego that grounds us, actually, egocentricity can become our enemy, for it keeps us. It, it says, no, I'm going to protect you from things that, that force you to uh, have anxiety. But it's in facing our fears and anxieties how we become a larger person. And then, of course, the other big one is ambivalence. Ambi, uh, weighing, valence means balance. Ambivalence, ambivalence means weighing the balance. Knowing that everything has an opposite side. Certainly everything I teach in this course or any course has an opposite side. There's always another way to look at something. See? And, and the mature person realizes, looks for the yin and the yang. Looks for the opposite in everything and tries to embrace it and integrate it. But the problem is, is when you hold two opposites consciously, it creates anxiety. And see, the immature person can't stand the anxiety, so what do we do? We polarize. So, well, I just want to believe this. I don't want to acknowledge the other side because it creates too much fear and anxiety. So we polarize, we stereotype, we become narrow in our thinking. See? And then we stay smaller people. And we don't take on the problems of the world, and we don't make a difference in life because the because we have because we're immature our ego hasn't developed enough to take on life's ambivalence ambiguity and anxiety um, and so there's nowhere uh, so, so when you come in to get education hopefully what happens is in any class you get challenged and you come uh, you confused and leave with a little anxiety anytime we grow we're, we're having to assimilate and accommodate new information. It does call anxiety and disturbance. And then when we integrate it into our own awareness, cognitive processes, emotional life, we actually become bigger people. And uh, I, I think that's the evolutionary push <laughs> of the source of life itself, libido energy, is that, we're, is that we're always being pushed to become bigger people. More aware, more mature, more... Uh, tolerant, developing our warrior, developing our caregiver, our lover, our destroyer, our seeker, developing these things. I mean, you try to stop it, you're trying to stop the sow salmon going upstream in, in the Arkansas River. These forces and archetypal energies are always moving, and the idea is to acknowledge them when they move. So, one of the things I said last time is, uh, is the goal in the first half of life is the, the first half of life. Where am I going to write this? Oh, we have a backside here. The first half of life is to become one's gender. Now, I have no idea what that means, because <laughs> that means that's culturally it's different. It's uh, the first half of life is to become one's gender and or become, uh, you know, to, to resolve uh, sexual and gender identity issues. And remember, when did uh, Eric Erickson said? When did he say that happens mostly? You remember, so what stage of development was it? Five adolescence. And if you if you don't work through that, you end up with confusion, lost identity, identity confusion. Did y'all ever take that, you know about Eric Erickson's stages of development? Okay. 
And so often adolescence is when we, we're figuring out our values, how we're going to make a living, our sexual issues, our gender issues, what it means to be a man, a woman, um, uh, you know, how we express ourselves. All that happens in adolescence. And, you know, in our culture, our adolescence goes from 14 to 21, 28, 35. We have a long adolescence. Uh, and it's not bad, but much of it is we're trying to figure out who we are and how we're going to function in the world. And that's, that's a beautiful part of life. And it's affected by the gender role models we have. To a large degree, your role as a woman in terms of understanding a woman will be mother and female caregivers. Understanding men will be father and male caregivers. They just have an effect on us as we grow. So the second half of life uh, in the psychoanalytical model, penmanship, there we go, is uh, to become whole. Become a whole person by integrating your contra sex gender. I know I'm repeating what I did last week. And again, as I say all this, I'm not you in black and white. We see that the blend of masculine, feminine, male, female spirits, energies, and all of us. Uh, but the idea is the first half of life. Remember, uh, everything that's acceptable, we integrate into our personality. It's integrated into the ego, everything that's acceptable. But what's that not accepted, what do we do with it? We dump it into the unconscious, or we project it out on somebody else. See? So that uh, in the second half of life, it seems the journey is about meeting those parts of yourself you left behind. And I find in, in, in teaching this to college students that college students are already quite aware of issues that we've left behind. And so what Jung said is he made up a term for this. For the, uh, he, he felt there was a, uh, that since we all had a residue of the opposite sex gender within us, you know, the, we have hormones, men have feminine genes and women have masculine genes and hormones, that, uh, that the residue of our, for a woman, her masculine side, he called the animus, which means spirit in Latin. He called the animus as the, as the masculine archetype in a woman. And it's in the unconscious, soon to emerge. And in the male, his, what would his be? His unconscious side would be his anima, which means soul. And that would be his feminine side. And then we have all these energies within us, remember, all these complexes, things that make us up, define us. And so what, what ends up happening is um, let me see if I can do this in a way that I know you hate to see that go. <laughs> I'll do it this way. Let's talk about a woman's a woman's somebody's grinning out there, ego. And a woman's animus, and a man's ego, and a man's anima. Remember, this would be your masculine, feminine. Now, before everybody starts jumping around and going, "Hey, wait a minute, that's not fair," and who's to say what? And that, just stay with me. We're looking at a theoretical model. It's a model. It's not the model. Perhaps there's no the model. But what happens is, what happens to the, to the woman in the psychoanalytic model is that a woman projects her own masculine onto a male. In other words, she, a woman who hasn't integrated her masculine, will often look for a man to integrate that for her. For example, a woman who hasn't found her own assertiveness or ability to achieve her own warrior and seeker She's naturally drawn to a man whose ego developed in the first half of life, his warrior and seeker. And then the man who's not in touch with his own feminine 
archetypal energies that we call, say, lover, caregiver, feelings, emotions, what the man will do is he will project that onto a woman's ego. And when that projection is very positive toward both people, what do we call that? Falling in love. When we have this very positive projection toward an opposite sex person or, a, you know, in same-sex relationship, it's still the same kind of psychic functions going on. When we're really attracted to someone, oh my gosh, I just fell in love with this person. It's just unbelievable. Um, the, the psychoanalytic model asserts that what's really happening is what are you falling in love with? Aspects of your own personality projected onto that person, and aspects of that person's personality that you see illuminated. It's real hard to decide which is what, but often it's, it's projecting your own self. You're falling in love with your own self in characteristics you see in the other person. Ask that. That's a good question. Doesn't that reinforce stereotypes? In what way? Well, like, you know, uh, I in my opinion, a lot of people think that, you know, men are supposed to be masculine and that's how it works and that's how a husband's supposed to be and women are supposed to be feminine. So when they get married and if they don't completely understand themselves, then a guy looks for this motherly person and because it's part of him that he hasn't come to terms with. Yeah, yes. And if it's an anima male, which would be a man who's in touch with his feelings a lot, like many of us in psychology are, men are, what we're going to be attracted to, maybe, is in a relationship, is a woman's, the masculine. Maybe her strength of character. Maybe her, these masculine archetypal energies that she carries. Where, and, and a woman who, uh, ha, remember, we all have these masculine, feminine energies. A woman who has a lot of masculine energies, primarily conscious, she's going to be attracted to what? To a man who has a lot of feminine characteristics, conscious. So I'm, not, so I'm not trying to stereotype it. I'm just trying to say often we fall in love with our opposite. We fall in love with the part of ourself that's not developed. Now, maybe that's flipping the stereotype. But it's interesting. Why do we fall in love with someone and not another one? That's, that's a whole other course to look at that. And there are, of course, many reasons. But looking at it psychologically, since the journey of life is to become a whole person, uh, we would see that the psyche, the soul, is always pushing for that. So in our gender relationships, we're going to find in the attraction, we're going to find our opposite being manifested in another. That's why it's important to say, what do I love about this person? Whether you're straight or homosexual or gay, lesbian, anything. But what is it I'm attracted to in there? And more often than not, it's parts of our own process that are buried that we have projected out on that person. Um, and Huh? The more balanced an individual is, the less partners that they're going to find out there. The more balanced a person is, the less partners they're going to find out there? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think the opposite is true. I think the more balanced are, the more you won't, the unconscious won't be making the choice. And more your conscious world, because you'll know who you are. Push the button. Push the button. If you're that conscious of who you are, then you're not going to want to tolerate somebody that's just psychologically undeveloped. I mean, that. Well, that's it. That's it. That's there. That's when good news becomes bad news, Will. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's it. If we if we make the old if we make the old pyramid effect, and we have uh, uh, more mature, aware, less aware. Uh, see, just in sheer numbers, <laughs> the higher up you go on the plane, the fewer, uh, is there are fewer people that are more aware, then, you know, you're going to, you're not going to be interested in someone who's less aware. Uh, let me do another model that I've used in the past and people have bought. If this is a line of, if this is a line of maturity, awareness, uh, insight, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, and if this person meets someone over here and say, you're at this level, we'll make this a male, let's make this a female. 
again, uh, just for purposes of discussion here, if you meet someone down here who's not very aware, what are your reactions going to be? <laughs> Michelle, you got to push and say that out loud so that Amy can hear you and Shauna. <laughs> She's a dumb blonde. Didn't you think that was cute? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this guy meets some woman that's not very aware. You know, it could be a, a 25-year-old man meets a 7-year-old girl who's clumsy and unaware. No, no, I'm not talking about sexually and all that. It's a sick class here. Uh, but I'm talking, it's just meeting somebody who's, sorry, aunt, uh, just meeting someone who's a lot less mature. And what you're going to have two reactions. One is you're going to go, oh, gross, I can't relate to that person. But if you have awareness of your own immaturity, you're going to have grace and tolerance and understanding. But if you really can't stand that person, it's the chances are you really aren't as mature as you think you are. Because my shadow, my clumsy, bumbling, immature, unaware side, if I'm repulsed about that in someone else, chances are I really haven't embraced my clumsy, bumbling, immaturity that will always be there. But if I just acknowledge, well, they're just not as aware so therefore, I wouldn't be interested. So it can be a very positive thing. Now, what if you meet someone up here? We're talking from a guy's perspective. So you meet some at this level of maturity. What's going to be the response? What? Push the button. Join, join us on TV. Intimidation. Intimidation. Good. You'd be intimidated by someone who's... Hello. Back here, guys. Thank you. Be intimidated by someone who's more mature, aware... Uh, and so you might feel like, gee, that person would never be interested in me. They've got too much together. But what's the other thing that's happening? Cinco, it's your turn. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Uh, um, the person might help you grow. Yeah, you you admire them, and they might help you grow because you see maturity in them that go, wow, you know, I admire them, I look up to them because they really represent at some level your potential. See, they represent your potential. This person might represent your limitation, which you know about, your own limitation. This person represents your potential. Watch this, which you also know about. Because remember, we're people in process. Now, here's the killer. <laughs> this is the one that always makes it so much fun. So what's going to happen is we're really going to fall in love with people who are around our level of growth. And often what happens is the the, 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 you know, the hero male is going to arrest the damsel in distress. And what is he really doing? And so he thinks he's more mature and she's less mature. But what is he really doing? What, he, what he's doing is he's rescuing his own immature side that he's unaware of. I think that's in we. That's what... Um, yeah, the chivalrous love, exactly. And what she's doing, say the less aware woman, these stereotypes, and she falls in love with this guy who's going to rescue and be her hero because he's stronger and wiser and more intelligent, all these kind of things. What's she really uh, giving herself to? Really, she's responding to her own maturity, to her own development, to her own ability, intelligence and strength and ability to take charge of her life, but she's got it projected on another person. That's why when you have a positive uh, when you have a positive projection on someone, over here, thank you. Uh, when you have a positive projection and you fall in love with someone and they are just the cat's meow, the best, the finest, the most wonderful you could ever find in life, you know one, one way to cure that? Get married. <laughs> Lulu, are you with me? <laughs> John, are you with me? Somebody been married? The best way to cure that that I have found the perfect person, and that's not to say there aren't people, there, of course there are people that you're more fitted to be with than other people. And, uh, uh, and who would want to marry someone you didn't have this powerful projected image because you see a lot of yourself and they see themselves in you. But uh, that's what Robert Johnson talks about, that 10,000 volts of electricity, romantic love, which is the spirituality of Western world. That's where we find our ecstasy and agony. That's where, I mean, we promote this in maddening ways 
that if you just find the right person who'll take you away from life's drudgery and, and who will animate you, hear that word, anima, give you soulfulness, animate you, and watch this, that person will also give you animosity, hear animus, animosity, so you'll find these great positive and negative, exciting, made alive energies and you feel, uh, you know, 10 feet off the ground and you feel so alive and so energized because you have met this person. And, uh, and pretty soon you find they're just a normal person with bad breath and hang-ups and problems just like you are. And you go, oh my gosh, I just picked the wrong person. I've got to go find someone who will keep me on that romantic ecstasy and high all the time. See? Yes. Bad joke brings out the animal in you. Good. <laughs> brings the animal in you too. That's good. That's really good. And so what happens is, is, uh, is often, uh, you know, you wonder why 65% of marriages in towns of 350,000 or more fail. It's because what are we doing? We, we really don't know ourselves. I'm answering your question kind of well. We really don't know ourselves very well, do we? And so what we're doing, because we don't know ourselves, we let the unconscious do the picking. I'm telling you. That's what this is all about. <laughs> if, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if the ego has an awareness, ha if the ego has a, a relationship with its soul, its inner world, in other words, if there's more of me that's conscious, see, there's more of me than I'm aware of, then these choices become more, uh, uh, see, they become, in, they become in step with my inner world and not a victim of my inner world. The ego will never override the, the unconscious. <laughs> I mean, it's what we don't know about ourselves that we're making these choices. If you learn about yourself, then you're not, at, you're not so likely to be a victim of your negative issues. You know, there's uh, uh, the book's called uh, 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 Keeping the Love You Find. Do y'all know that book? Great book, Keeping the Love You Find by Hendrix. Keeping the Love You Find. Uh, and and all, all that's about is, uh, you know, we pick someone based on the positive and negative traits of our parents. Why would we want anybody different? We wouldn't. We think we're getting somebody different often if we have negative affiliation with our parents, but we'll find that they're much more positive and negative like our parents. And we, amar we, we marry, we date, and we go after our imago. It's called imago therapy, keeping the love you find. For couples, it's called getting the love you want. Fascinating stuff, because you see how we're driven by these unconscious forces. And we end up being victims of that. And that's why people get in and go, oh my gosh, this was terribly wrong. Because they're having clashes. But what's really going on? It's terribly right at some level, isn't it? Because you're forced to come to terms with your shadow. You're forced to come to terms with the things that you buried, that you just fell in love with in another person. And here's what's really interesting, <clears throat> is the goal is to find someone to match up with, marry, date, be together, share life with, who's willing to do their inner work and to allow and help you to do your inner work who's willing to accept you and be a container for your own wounds and issues, and, and they'll let you be that for them, and to grow and to come to terms with. And, uh, for example, uh, a man who can't express his feelings very well, and so he marries this woman or falls in love with a woman who's very connected to her feelings, cries easily, uh, laughs, uh, very sensitive to her feelings. Well, he marries her, and you know he's going to be in charge of everything and run the show Mr. Logic, and she's going to do all the feeling. Well, so she's always crying and he's not, so she cries for herself and him too. But what might happen in a relationship if they really decided to own their own shadow? She could teach him about dealing with his feelings. Because as a child, he probably got shamed and put down for having normal human feelings. Like most men, he repressed his feelings. My God, many women repress their feelings. But most men repress their feelings. And so that relationship becomes an opportunity for him to learn to <clears throat> express and deal with his feelings without feeling abandoned, attacked. You see how that might work? 
And wouldn't it be marvel, wouldn't it be incredible to find someone to share life with who could help you grow and you could help them grow? And if, if he's got a lot of logic working and making tough decisions and, and her feelings run her too much, then maybe he can teach her how to do that. See? And I know those comments are stereotypical, aren't they? But it could be a man full of feeling and a woman full of logic. <laughs> and they marry one another. They are attracted to one another mystically because actually he's going to help her get in touch with feelings that she's buried. And she's going to help him get in touch with logic. Many of our gender classes, clashes, <laughs> classes too, are really because we haven't integrated our own stuff. What we hate out there and admire out there is stuff in our own life. Um, okay, so let me uh, talk a little bit about, uh, any questions or comments on that? Does some of that make sense in uh, Shauna and Amy? Yes. Or do you disagree with it? You don't have to agree with it. I'm just sort of throwing this out. In fact, uh, look at your little uh, paper I handed you. I'll just kind of read what I just went over. Uh, see that thing right there on invisible partners? Y'all got it? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I guess I'll leave it on. The, I'll read it on here. So It says, if the positive aspects of the anima image is projected by a man onto a woman, then she becomes highly desirable for him. She fascinates him, draws him to her, and seems to him to be the source of happiness and bliss. A woman who carries this projection for a man readily becomes the object of his erotic fantasies, sexual longings. It seems uh, to the man that if he could only be with her and make love to her, he would be fulfilled. Such a state uh, we call falling in love or being in love. It's also, you can also walk, in, walk into love instead of fall into love. Naturally, a woman who carries such a powerful anima projection is pleased, at least at first. She feels flattered and valued, and though she may be only dimly aware of it, she enjoys a feeling of considerable power, you know, to have a man pawing and begging at her feet. The person who carries a projected psychic image of another person does have, have power over that person for as long as a part of our own uh, of our psyche is perceived in someone else, that other person has power over us. It's the charismatic minister, it's your father or your mother who has power over you. You're, you don't have your authority, they have it. It could be a, a political leader, it could be the boss at work, male or female, someone who they have power and authority but we haven't found ours. See what I'm saying? And if somebody else has all the power and you don't, you're skating on thin ice. Okay, the woman usually regrets the situation. In time, however, she has experiences, experiences the disagreeable side of being the carrier of another person's soul. Honey, go put, your, put that cute little sexy thing on. You look so frumpy in that outfit. I need to be animated by you. See? Okay, you mean I can't, you know, I can't just be me? I've always got to be what you need me to be? See how that struggle works? Back here again. She eventually discovered that the man begins to suffocate her. She may find that he resents it when she is not immediately and always available to him. This gives uh, an oppressive quality to their relationship. Remember why we talked about smothering? She will also discover that the man resents any attempt on her part to develop her own individual personality in such a way that it goes beyond the anima image he has placed on her. For in fact, he sees not her as she actually is, but what? As he wants her to be. He wants her to fulfill and live out for him his projected feminine image. And this inevitably will collide with her human reality as a person. So she may find herself living in a box, fenced in by his determination that she fulfill his uh, projection for him. And she may discover that the shadow side of his seeming love for her is really possessive and restrictive, sort of codependent, and on his part that thwarts his own natural tendency to become an individual. When she insists on being herself, she may find her man jealous, resentful, and pouting. She may also begin to dread his sexual advances 
which she begins to suspect are not functions of the relationship between them, but have a compulsive, unrelated quality to them. Indeed, the two easily wind up at loggerheads regarding sexuality. Now, I won't read all this. Let me just move over to the other side. <clears throat> I mean, you can read the rest uh, on your own, but uh, this other side says the, the same projections are made by women onto men, of course. If a woman, see where I'm reading there? Oh my gosh, they moved in close. Nice job. If a woman projects onto a man her positive onimus image, the image of savior, hero, spiritual guide, she overvalues that man. She is fascinated by him, drawn to him, sees him as the ultimate man, the ideal lover. She feels completed only through him, as though it were through him that she found her soul. Such projections are especially likely to be made onto men who have the power of the word. You know, teachers, speakers, people, men, men who uses wor a man who uses words well, who has power with ideas, is a effective in getting them across is an ideal figure to carry such anima projections for a woman. When this happens, he becomes bigger than life to her. You know, like, I just want to talk to my dad because he really knows how to make sense with everything. And that's a classic thing that a young woman might have. You know, I just need to call my dad because he'll explain this in a way I can never understand it. You know, it's like he's got the words to figure it out, but I don't. And obviously you can use dad to develop your own or any, any person. A woman who has a good time with her. So, and she is quite content to be the loving moth fluttering around his flame. <laughs> In this way, she misses the creative flame within herself, having displaced it onto the man. You kind of get that? So there, there we are with our little deal here. So what happens is, a woman's inner spirit or animus gets projected out onto a man, and a man's feminine soul uh, gets projected out onto a woman. And that's what we call falling in love, attraction. It happens hundreds of times, probably uh, dozens of times every day. It doesn't have to be a lover. It could be anyone. Why am I attracted to that person? It could be somebody at a red light. You just look over and have this rush of karma toward that person. And, uh, you know, what is that all about? Well, in, in this model, it's that, it's that other side that's awakened, that other side that's awakened because of someone else, how someone looks, what someone says, how we experience another. And uh, this is a fundamental truth. Uh, uh, Sanford says, we project all that we do not consciously experience of our inner life onto the other. We project all of our inner life that we do not consciously experience onto the other. Romantic love gives us profound connectedness, new energy, hope, a sense of homecoming, but it won't last. This person's different. I've never felt like this before. What we're really doing is, and, I, and I'm not demeaning because you certainly don't want to marry someone you don't have this energy with because you're setting something up. But if this is the only thing we go by, you know, it's like I often ask couples, you know, have y'all had a fight? Have y'all had a clash? They said, oh, no, we never fight. I go, how sad, because they're living in that bubble, aren't they? But they said, yeah, we got a lot of differences. Good. You know, we, we see things very differently. Good. That can enrich, cause that positive and negative energy. And we are attracted in some ways. Great. We clash in some ways. Great. Because that means it'll force you both to grow. Uh, we fall in love with our own missing parts. Projections die, they're supposed to, uh, but often the love feels catastrophic. Um, but really what's happening is we're getting down to a more person-to-person -person level. And uh, in our next class, we're going to look at real more directly what the anima is in a man, the positive traits and negative traits of it, the feminine side in a man, uh, and then uh, look at the animus, the experience of a masculine in a woman. And uh, how it embodies a woman, gives her a sense of groundedness and place. Um, so I'll see you next class.